I'm Kyle McNulty, and you're listening to Secure Ventures, the show that follows cutting-edge founders in the cybersecurity space to understand their plights, glories, and revolutionary products. With me in this episode is Greg Martin. Greg is CEO and co-founder of Ghost Security, which is an API and application security platform providing contextualized risk awareness of a company's cloud application profile. Ghost is Greg's third company. He previously founded Jask, a SOC automation tool, which he sold to Sumo Logic in 2019. Before Jask, he founded Anomaly, which was an early threat intelligence platform. The company is still alive and strong today, and he still sits as an advisor. In the episode, we discuss some of the key inflection points with each of his companies, the challenges inherent with being a category creator, and the value resulting from his role as an angel investor in the ecosystem. Greg, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kyle. So take me back to the beginning of your career, because your LinkedIn starts in 2012 with Anomaly. But I think before that, you were still working in the cybersecurity space, getting your your kind of feet wet in the industry. What did it actually look like for you? Sure. I had a, a really fun career, um, started in, in cybersecurity space and uh, what you could argue was the early days and uh, um, kind of diverse set of experiences from getting to work with uh, law enforcement like FBI, Secret Service, uh, a little stint at NASA. And uh, I ended up at a startup um, based in Cupertino, California called ArcSight. And uh, they were the leader in the emerging category called SIM at the time. And uh, this is when a lot of the kind of Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies were just starting to build their first security operation centers internally. And uh, the, the SIM and and uh, ArcSight where it was a very popular option for building your SOC around that that tooling. So my job was to run around the, the country and eventually uh, around the world, uh, helping these big organizations build their security operation centers. It was a, it was a lot of fun. And uh, that's where I learned some of the things that um, kind of helped me figure out how do I transition from, you know, being a practitioner uh, to being an innovator and an entrepreneur, how do I take some of the lessons learned from these customers and and you know create a product that uh, that we can ultimately build a company around? So it's pretty fascinating experience, right? I think you mentioned FBI, NASA, and then obviously ArcSight, which is super well known in the security industry today. I have to ask, why did you choose to exclude that from your LinkedIn? What's the thought process there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that uh, I had it there for a long time. And, you know, I, my kind of brand was this kind of hacker turned entrepreneur. And a lot of it was my early background. And um, now for the last 10 years, I spent so much of my time kind of uh, helping coach entrepreneurs in, in their startup journey. Um, I think my my personal brand has changed. I'm more well known for that now, kind of being, uh, you know, an investor, an advisor. And um, it was really just like, hey, you know, maybe this stuff doesn't really matter to folks anymore, right? So I just chopped it off, and uh, <laughs> you know, the great thing about LinkedIn is you're in control of uh, of your own history. So, <laughs> yeah, totally for for better and for worse, I guess, in terms of the the overall ecosystem. I was just looking at a Jack Rysider's LinkedIn profile yesterday, the the host of the podcast Darknet Diaries, and it was pretty funny actually. His uh, his profile is worth a look for anyone who's curious. Basically, every piece of sensitive information is redacted. So his location is United States. His profile picture is an artist sketch. His previous companies that he worked at are all redacted. There's no information about any of the uh, specific job titles. And it makes sense given kind of the stories that he tells on his podcast in terms of like actual um, hacking experiences, but definitely taken to the extreme in terms of the the point that you're making, you control your, your information. And we're, we're kind of jumping ahead. I didn't think we were going to get into this until much later. But you mentioned the investor activity that you've had personally, and that stuck out to me. I mean, I don't know if you're like reaching the limit of number of things that you can have on your LinkedIn page as well, but the number of different companies that you have uh, on there in terms of advisor or investor. And I'm curious specifically how your role as an investor has influenced your kind of participation in the ecosystem and potentially like provided a leg up when it comes to Ghost or either of your your previous companies, Jask, Anomaly, uh, the the kind of advantages that have come from that. Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, let me see if I can do my best uh, to to answer it. So my intent in investing was uh, uh, twofold. One, after I sold uh, Jask, it got acquired by Sumo Logic. I had uh, you know a couple of years where 
I was on on the team at Sumo, kind of integrating the company, and I felt like I had more free time than I was used to. Um, so I wanted to get more active and involved in, in the startup community and investing and advising. So that was a, a, a part of it. The other part of it was when I started my journey, I had a lot of help. I had some very influential uh, angel investors that um, not only put in uh, money, but more importantly, they really helped kind of coach and, and drive me and understand, you know, what does it take to be a good founder? What does it take to um, be able to raise money from the the, the top people in Silicon Valley? Um, what does it mean to be a good leader? Like uh, all these things, um, you know, you're not bored with this ability. You have to learn it over time, right? And, um, you know, what I learned is, you know, surrounding yourself with people that, you know, can be really strong mentors in this area. They've done it before very successfully. And they have the time to help you and they have uh, the desire uh, to invest in you personally. So you built a personal relationship. That person cares about you. Um, so those three things I, I find ingredients that I share with every young entrepreneur that's on their first startup journey. Uh, every uh, founder is like, hey, go get three or four of these mentors that check all these boxes. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, I, I end up being one of those mentors. Um, but I think it, it goes back to the, the the idea that nobody can do this alone, right? It takes a village and, and you really have to seek out people to, to help you and use your vulnerability as, as a weapon, as I often tell them, right? I'm, I'm new. I don't know what I'm doing. I need all the help I can get. And uh, it's funny that I still say that uh, I need all the help I can get you know, to this day. It's my third startup and people are like, oh, you know what you're doing, but you know, it's still, it's nobody can do it alone. So it sounds like there's a, a couple specific elements that you mentioned there. There's a piece of kind of giving back to the community based on the amount of help that you received. There's obviously still the kind of financial returns from the investing and just the upside there. What about specifically in terms of helping build? Like I, if the answer is maybe there aren't that many synergies, then so be it. But I'm curious if there's maybe one specific example where like a founder that you helped back and invest in, uh, then like you got in front of one of their customers to then sell the ghost product or uh, other kind of partnerships that have been mm-hmm. formed through those kind of relationships. Any specific examples? Yeah, that that's a, a great question. No, I think you build relationships and you end up helping each other. I learned so much from the companies that I've invested in, no matter where they are on their their journey of being an entrepreneur or a startup. Um, you know, uh, just you're constantly learning and helping each other. But um, I never did it uh, for the 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 direct benefits of any of the things that that I'm doing operationally. Um, and, and I don't think anybody should expect or think of it that way, but you will get things, uh, in return over time. It may take 10 years. Uh, and then, you know, you get a check in the mail for your investment. That's always nice when that happens. Sometimes you get nothing <laughs> in return for your investment and that's okay too. Right. Um, you know, I think that if you're going to get into the angel investing game, um, you know, you should really, you know, use like. 10% of, of your overall portfolio that you've communicate, uh, you've, um, you know, accumulated throughout your life. Say, okay, this is my play money that I can go and make these investments and have fun. And it's like, um, you know, when you go to Vegas, and you're like, Hey, I want to play some blackjack. You probably set aside, okay, I'm comfortable losing up to the $500 or a thousand dollars or whatever your, your number is. You, you pull that out and you kind of tell yourself, I'm not going to Spend any more than this, right? So I think uh, angel investing is is, is uh, analogous a little bit to gambling in Vegas, but uh, it's it, it's more sure. fun in my opinion. Yeah, it's more fun. Yeah, it's funny. I think a lot of people would would like to think that it's a whole lot more productive than that, but you're probably right. There's there's probably a lot of people that think gambling in Vegas is very productive as well. Uh, I guess it all depends what the goal is, right? I mean, look, I don't do it to uh, make money. I do it uh, because I believe in these founders, these entrepreneurs, and I want to help them. And I think by investing money gives you a little bit more purpose and skin in the game. Um, and uh, I also, you know, coach them. I say, hey, when you go out to find your advisors and mentors, get them to put in a little money, even if it's a small amount. Um, you know, it, it helps kind of align incentives and, and it just feels a little bit more real, their involvement versus just, giving them an advisor agreement that maybe uh, gives them some shares or equity, small amount of equity in the company, have them put some personal money into. And uh, I always think that that kind of just creates a stronger uh, alignment uh, in that that relationship over time, right? They're, they're, they're literally on the team with you aligned for the same goals. Yeah, no question. It gives them that extra kind of boon, 
bonus or boost to actually go ahead and, and uh, put in the, the little bit of extra effort and make some of those connections or uh, spend a little bit more time, whatever that looks like. Let's get back to your career story here because we started talking about all the different pieces now and we need to, to tie it together. So Anomaly was a threat intelligence platform, to my understanding, at kind of the, the highest level. The It was the very first. Um, so there okay. was... Uh, yeah, we. I created some open source tool that um, you know went out and it kind of pioneered this concept of gathering open source uh, threat indicators or IOCs um, to put them into ArcSight. And this was a tool that I just kind of like came up with creatively around like 2008 um, to figure out you know how can we you know help show value really quickly with our sim product. It would be great if we could take all of these indicators of bad uh you know dns host names that are known in, in command and control and scrape them from these you know malware analysis blog sites and so on and so forth and then you know cram them into the sim and if any traffic is going back and forth you know alert on it and and that that open source tool became you know incredibly popular to the to the point where we saw it being used in hundreds of customers uh, from jp morgan to intel company to the government of israel the government of japan so I'm, I'm looking at who's downloading this tool, and this is a little side project that I built on the side. And uh, I'm looking at these because uh, Google Analytics will kind of show you the network of, of who's hitting the download page, and that's how I'm figuring out who's using it. Wow, this is a really impressive <laughs> list of organizations. You know, maybe I should be charging for this thing, or maybe it can be more than it is. And that's really um, where I got this idea of, hey, you know, I should I should take this thing more seriously. And um, I printed that list out. I shared it with, uh, at the time, the the CEO of uh, ArcSight. We had just sold the company to HP, and everybody was kind of going their separate ways. And um, his, his name's Tom Riley, and he became one of those, you know, very impactful, incredible mentors that I was just mentioning. Um, and, and I just reached out to him, and I said, hey, Tom, you know, you barely know me. I was, you know, just a peon in your 700 person organization we rode in the elevator a few times together you know but uh here's what i'm doing here's what i built um you know here's the list of who, who's using it and uh he immediately got back to me he's like greg this is phenomenal um i not only want to you know invest 250k but i'd also like to uh to join your board and and help you out um you know i was living in new york city at the time and had no intention of of leaving and he said, one caveat, you have to move to Silicon Valley. Uh, so I was like, well, okay. <laughs> so I, the, I was, uh, I was, you know, in a car driving cross country within a week from then. And uh, yeah, he invested in, um, and uh, the rest was history. That was kind of my, my entrepreneurial uh, journey from the very beginning. And, you know, it, it uh, I never imagined this for myself at the time. Yeah, I was about 29 years. Um, it was uh, extremely exciting and, and uh, transformed my entire life, basically. Uh, once I got to the Bay Area, um, you know, he told me that things would move a lot faster because you're surrounded with this community of VCs and other uh, startup people. And uh, frankly, I didn't believe him. I thought having a cool office in Soho, downtown New York, would be the dream come true with the exposed brick walls. And, um, you know, I thought, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It doesn't matter where I am. Um, but uh, come to find out, he was, at the time, he was completely right. I mean, once I got to Silicon Valley, it just, boom, off like a rocket ship. And, um, yeah, I think Google Ventures invested within uh, three months of, of me landing in, in, in Silicon Valley. They were our first major investors. And um, I think they hadn't done not many deals at that point. They were a new firm. And. They'd done Uber was their big one before that, and then they invested in in, uh, in a novel. Okay, so a lot to to unpack there, and certainly we're going to have to come back to this yeah. whole Silicon Valley versus everywhere else uh, theme, given where you are sitting today, and and we will. But before that, I want to talk about this kind of open source transition. Right, there's plenty of open source projects that have been particularly successful that haven't turned into successful businesses and kind of monetization strategies. What was that story like for you with Anomaly? How tricky was it to get people to start paying for something that they'd gotten accustomed to getting for free? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the case of Anomaly, uh, it was actually very easy uh, to convert them. And 
Um, you know, I always say that you're, you already have your foot in the door. They already trust you. They're you're already using your product. Um, so to be able to start a conversation and say, Hey, we have this premium version we created with this X amount of new features. Um, are you willing to take a look? Uh, it's a much easier uh, process to call up, you know, Comcast or Bank of America and say, Hey, you're using my tool right now. You know, we just created this company and we have like a premium version that has all these things. Um, there, that's a, a much easier motion because your foot's already in the door. Um, but getting there and building the community, uh, having an open source project that's that's successful like that, I think that's that's very hard and it's much harder today than it was back then in you know twenty. Uh, 2009 to, to 2013, which is when the, the the height of that open source project, because I think that just wasn't that many really popular open source security projects back then, right? And uh, now there's there's so many, and it's so crowded that uh, I always liken it to you know tree falling in the forest. Did anybody hear that tree fall? And um, you know you can create an open source tool, but the challenge is you have to really know how to market it and get it popular. And I think uh, I benefited originally through the community of ArcSide customers and being there and being able to promote it that way. Uh, looking back, I think that that helps a lot. Um, but also just having a niche, um, you know, we had something very specific or a very specific use case. Uh, so I think it's still very popular. It's just a little bit harder um, than saying, hey, look what I created and posting on Hacker News. And then next day you have 100,000 users. That whole workflow, I think, is is just not quite as simple and straightforward as it used to be. That makes sense. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely just much more um, content, much more noise on any of those platforms like Hacker News, Product yeah. Hunt, uh, et cetera, right? So there's, there's all these channels where people can find your platforms today, but almost because those channels are so active, um, it's not necessarily just a a simple panacea for getting your product out there and, and getting that open core model in front of people. Yeah. We're, we're kind of, um, inundated with choices and it, that's a bit paralyzing. It's like, well, this may be a really cool tool, but somebody else launched five other cool tools this week. Which one do I look at? I'm not going to look at any of them. <laughs> that's kind of, you know, what, what happens? I, I think, um, you know, my current company, we released a, a really cool open source tool called Reaper. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's gotten a good reception, um, but it's not in the hundreds of thousands of users like we had hoped. And, um, you know, I think that it, it's gotten a lot more difficult to promote your new open source uh, tool, be it cybersecurity or, or otherwise. And, um, you know, you just have to keep fighting it at figuring out how to promote it, how to build a community around that tool. Um, because it is possible. It just requires a, a ton of work, in my opinion. We're jumping around again, but I don't want to miss this specific follow-up thread here. So thinking about your Reaper tool today with Ghost, what was the most successful angle that you found in terms of actually being able to promote the platform? Yeah, I think uh, the majority of the promotion we've done is on LinkedIn so far. And, um, you know, I think maybe, um, you know, we should have or could promote it in some other areas, get more of a wider reach, but we've been pretty successful. Uh, we're just promoting on LinkedIn and our own networks of, of all of our, uh, um, you know, our, our team members, our investors, our advisors and friends. Um, one thing that we did that I think is really helpful is making a short video kind of demonstrating how the product works. And uh, if you if you do that and you, you don't make it too long, it's like 30 seconds to, to two minutes max and put some cool music on it and, and do, do a little bit of editing that you know, um, and, and create a landing page that kind of explains what the product is, the cool logo, things like that go a long way. You have to put a little bit of effort into branding your project. If you just put it out there and it's like a page with black and white text, what's going to separate that tool from another one to get people's attention and, and gravitate people to it versus projects that people put some effort behind, they brand it, they come up with a cool name, maybe a logo, they make a cool uh, flashy video and landing page. You're, you're more likely to attract a larger number of people if you put that that effort into it. So that that's one thing we did that uh, ho hopefully uh, answers your question. Yeah, totally. And I think also just the the very first point there, right, which is score another one for LinkedIn. Yeah. Obviously, everyone in cybersecurity kind of understands uh, how active security practitioners, especially security leaders, yeah. are on LinkedIn. Uh, and so that's kind of 
the de facto, I would say, but still worth kind of questioning from time to time, okay, is that where we should be spending our efforts uh, just because that's where we've been spending them traditionally? And I think your point just shows right there that yes, absolutely, there's still a lot to be gained from just some of that organic traffic on LinkedIn, maybe paid as well, but leveraging the the network and understanding that people yeah. still are looking there for content. So let's go back to the the timeline here a little bit, sure. because again, we're, we're going all over the place and we're going to bring this all back together. In 2012 or so is when you take Anomaly uh, into like a, an actual company structure. That's when you move out to Silicon Valley, right? You're going through all this kind of high growth um, opportunity. You get the money from Google Ventures. You're getting some of those initial customers using your list that you have uh, from just interested open source folks. I think it's about two years later, maybe 2014 or so, if I'm remembering correctly, that you end up uh, moving into the CTO role from the CEO role. And then in 2016, you end up leaving Anomaly or rather kind of taking a step back in terms of your involvement with Anomaly and you go and start JASK. So we'll get into JASK in a second. But I mean, walk me through that period, kind of how that unfolded for you and what that looked like. Yeah, no, I think this is a, a really important thing to talk about because I made a decision that um, I think a lot of founders uh, go through and uh, it can be sometimes a really uh, good process and sometimes a very uncomfortable process uh, to downright ugly process. And that is when you're doing so well as a first time founder that your board knocks on the door and they say, hey, uh, <laughs> great job things are going amazing. Is this a good time that we bring in a pro uh, CEO? And that's exactly what uh, happened to me. We were high flying, going crazy at the time. I was not a proven um, you know, business leader. And while I was doing by every measure a really great job, uh, I think that you know when a lot of investors see that happening, they want to kind of hedge their bets and they're like, wow, this thing could be a rocket ship. We better throw in a pro CEO at this point. And uh, I think that sometimes it's a good idea, depending on the background uh, and who the founder is and um, you know, wh- whether they have the right ingredients to be a good CEO and um, you know, they have the, the right employee to reflect and grow and so on and so forth. Uh, I think for me at the time, it was uh, the decision that I made to say, yes, let's do it. Let's bring in a pro CEO. Um, I'll flip over to CTO, I think, uh, and stand by that it was the right decision. Um, you know, looking back sometimes, you know, I think, oh, man, what, what would happen if I stayed in the role with a company had done a lot better? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, who, who's to say, right? Um, I don't like playing what if games. Uh, but what it did was it allowed the company to flourish. Uh, we put in a pro CEO, um, unfortunately, you know, he didn't work out. They they then replaced him with another CEO, but um, the company is is still doing, um, you know, quite well. They have not been acquired yet um, by any stretch of the measure. They're still uh, one of, if not the top player in the threat until space, and uh, something I'm incredibly proud of. And I'm sure that uh, all the investors and and shareholders, including myself, will will have a huge benefit from from that company at some point. Uh, well, in the not too far off future. Um, but, um, yeah, that journey for me was, uh, was mixed emotions, but, um, I think at the end of the day, reflecting back, it was the right one for me. And, um, it, it freaked me off to go do other things. And I started a, a new company, which, which we can talk about. Um, I lasted maybe a year as CTO and I realized once you give up the role of being the leader, it's very hard, uh, to stay on and uh, take a secondary role and not be calling the shots anymore. And I think if anything, that's the one thing I underestimated when I made that decision was how happy would I be uh, working in a company where I was no longer the one calling the shots. And uh, for me, I, I wasn't happy. And, and ultimately, that's that's uh, what precipitated me kind of moving on and, and doing a new company uh, and then trusting that the team would flourish and, and do okay without me. And of course, I stayed on it as advisor, but um, really that's just more of, you know, I'm here if you need me, uh, you know, use my name. I can talk to some customers. Um, how many founders have I seen that have gone through a similar situation, whether they got asked to, you know, raise your hand, bring in a new CEO or, um, in cases, you know, they were kind of pushed to the side in a more kind of aggressive fashion. Um, uh, this has happened, 
um, you know, to folks around me, maybe 30 times in the, in the last, um, you know, eight years of me paying attention to it. And, um, it's interesting. And a lot of folks come to me and talk to me about it and want to get my feedback. Is this the right decision? Should I do this? How is this uh, process for you? And, um, that's one of the, one of the reasons why I really got invested in helping first time founders, um, and, uh, being somebody there that they could talk to you, bounce ideas off of, and, and ultimately became kind of more of a formal advisor investor. The idea was, you know, I've been through all these journeys, you know, up and down and sideways, you know, uh, how can I pay this back? How can I, you know, do some of the cool things that Tom Riley did for me early in my career as an entrepreneur? Because it's it, it's lonely at the top. You'll hear that when you talk to a lot of founders. Uh, there's not a lot of folks that they can talk to that truly understand what they're going through. Um, so to to be able to turn around and give that back, it, it it feels really good to be able to help people. Yeah, I want to go one layer deeper because you mentioned this idea of okay, now in the CTO role, you're not calling the shots anymore. Ultimately, I mean, CTO, number two in an organization, there's a lot of shots that you probably still are calling, right? Like maybe a lot of the product related decisions uh, you still have some control over. And maybe the CEO in that case did have some specific product strategy influence. uh, But what was maybe most pronounced that you felt uh, those are the shots in particular that I still want to be calling that I feel like I no longer have that opportunity to? What was most pronounced there? Yeah, no, that's a good question. My case was really unique because the CEO we hired uh, happened to be a CTO before. So I think we found a little bit of friction there um, where he still wanted to have a lot of influence. And I felt like, okay, well, if I can't own, if I'm not doing the CEO and I can't fully own the CTO thing, you know, uh, what value am I going to bring here? And and that ultimately led to my decision to, to kind of move on. Um, but I think that if in the cases that I have seen founders stay on, they typically take, you know, head of product, technical founders like myself, head of product, um, chief architect, uh, I've seen kind of like chief strategy, uh, sometimes it's CTO. Um, but a lot of times it's kind of this, um, you know, nebulous, I don't have any direct reports, uh, I'm there to kind of keep the continuity of the culture of the company, uh, help the kind of brand and, and ambassador of the, the product in the market. And uh, I've seen, you know, a lot of early initial founders transition into that role and thrive and stay on for 10 plus years. And then I can give you a number of companies that I want to kind of like, you know, call them out. But uh, another number of companies that have done really amazing. Uh, through that journey and the founders have stayed on uh, in a diminished capacity, but they're there and they get to, to ride on the journey and, and, you know, when they hopefully end up on the, the, the New York stock exchange or NASDAQ one day, you know, they're standing up there maybe to the side of the CEO, um, but they're there and they're very happy with that. And um, I think that's, uh, that's absolutely fine for, for me. Um, personality wise, I, I couldn't sit, sit still. I had to go do something else. And that was, was my calling to, to start another company. And, um, that, that's what happened. And, and then again, a third time, so <laughs> something's, something's wrong with me. But, uh, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's journey is different and you have to listen to your heart and, uh, you know, time is the most valuable resource that we have. And uh, if you look at it through that lens, you know, you just got to, you know, uh, know who you are and listen to yourself and say, what am I supposed to be doing with my life right now? Am I supposed to be hanging out here, helping this thing be a success? Or should I be out creating brand new innovation with the, the freshest time that I have left in, in, in my life? You know? So you move on to the next company, which is Jask, and you've kind of set the stage for this nicely, right? You're working at ArcSight early in your career, you get some familiarity with the SIM space, you end up building a threat intelligence platform that's directly synced up with ArcSight, feeding IOCs into ArcSight. Then you say, okay, well, all these socks are still full of manual labor. What if we have more automation in there? So now you're fairly early in the source space as well. When you go ahead and start Jask, 
that ends up getting acquired. I think it's three years later by yeah. Sumo Logic. Yeah, that's uh, really it was fast. presumably a, a great exit there, yeah. and especially given that timeline. I mean, what was one of the the key lessons for you from that whole experience? Just I, I know it's so hard to distill three years in such a tumultuous journey. I'm sure, but thinking about that that kind of time frame in your career, what was most pronounced in terms of a lesson learned? Yeah, so many lessons learned, Kyle. It was uh, it was an incredible journey, and and um, you know a really really fun one. And and you know it was about four and a half years uh, all all together from start to finish. So it was a very short uh, run, but um, I I would say that we were we were early, uh, maybe too early to the market with the concepts we were trying to introduce. It was really kind of this idea of um, not just soar, but how do you kind of fully automate the 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 level one SOC analyst and um you know probably you you and i have a similar background in growing up in the in the sock world and um you know you probably heard the phrase sock monkey thrown around to describe uh, a, a tier one analyst and i would always get really heated when i heard somebody say something like that i'm like look this is a entry level person trying to learn cybersecurity, coming in and, and learning the craft and yeah, you might not value their job and maybe machines will be doing this in the future, but have some respect for this person that's trying to break in and, and learn this. And some of uh, some of the folks that I worked with, the SOC 1 analysts are now CISOs. Um, so it, it's an incredible place to, to start your career and, and um, you know, working the SOC, I still have a, a, a big uh, a big amount of empathy and, and uh, respect for people that, that do that job. But um, we, we wanted to make it easier. Right? How do we take all these uh, systems that are firing off alerts and how do we ingest them and, and make meaning and context and automate some decision-making process? And that was really the concept. Um, what we found um, you know, in, in the market is that uh, we were taking a path that nobody else was taking and that made it hard to sell because we were having to kind of create this, this uh, education process that, hey, we have this thing that you need, but you don't know why you need it because nobody else is doing it and, and we're being very innovative. So, you know, to do something like that, to blaze a new trail, it's incredibly capital intensive. You need enough money uh, raised to go the, the the long game of building a market and, and being the, the the first mover. And, um, you know, we were, we were running that route and uh, the market started to shift on us just a little bit and it became a little bit harder. And uh, we had the pressure of people wanted a, a cloud-based SIM. So we were like, okay, well, what is it going to take to take our technology and turn it into a full-blown SIM? Well, we had to basically create a, a cloud version of Splunk. We had to have that kind of log management storage search. And uh, that was going to take double the capital and double the time. And uh, a company called Sumo Logic that had already done that, had built that cloud-based Splunk, uh, came along at the same time we were trying to, we were at that very... Uh, important decision making process do we raise uh, a ton more money and and keep going down this path or or do we find a better home here that um you know works out for all the employees all the investors and um you know works out great for for sumo and it was one of those things where um you know it was a one plus one equals three scenario uh we were able to do a, a mostly stock uh acquisition uh, which was great because they had just filed uh, to to go public on the Nasdaq. So we sold their com the company Jazz to Sumo in 2019, and then we got to stay on and, and go through the IPO process, uh, which was weird because it was during COVID, but it was totally uh, a, a once in a lifetime experience, and it was super fun to to be up there and get to uh, ring the bell and go through that, and cer certainly a proud moment and a fun experience that I'll cherish throughout my life. One of the things that's fascinating to me about just having this podcast and having talked to so many founders is something that you hear one founder say as a positive, another founder will position as a negative, and you kind of have this mm -hmm. this flip flopping back and forth for a whole variety of different topics, right? And I think the the root of that is there's just other context that comes into play uh, with each of the different Got scenarios, it. and and every kind of company has its own unique journey to an extent and there's some patterns that you can kind of pick out the the specific one that i'm getting at here is you talk about the challenges of being a kind of category leader a category builder in a sense right of having yeah. to 
uh, generate all this awareness, the amount of capital that you have to raise as a result, um, how the kind of market switching in terms of what it was specifically looking for, uh, then mm-hmm. created these new challenges, right? Whereas a lot of people would say, oh yeah, we had the perfect opportunity because we were so early and we were Good. the category builder. So we were the de facto choice. And and I think it's just fascinating to, to point that out. Um, and it, it makes sense in the context of what you're describing, right? Because there's the other factors that are at play where it's not just about the category of SOC automation, but the category of like a cloud-based SOC more generally and how that expands what was required of your platform, um, which then affects some of that calculus. For for sure. I mean, it, 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 absolutely, you get a lot of advantages by, by being the first mover. You also uh, have a very, very tall mountain to climb. And uh, it is not an easy road. And I think what uh, a lot of folks, when they look at the entrepreneurial and, and specifically the cybersecurity um, you know, startup business as a whole. Uh, and you see a lot of really smart people like uh, Ross Halleck, like blog about this kind of stuff on LinkedIn. Um, you know, only a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of a fraction of companies make it to be standalone IPO candidates like a CrowdStrike. Um, so out of all the thousands of uh, VC investments into the thousands of, of new cybersecurity startups, um, you know, less than 1% of those will actually become standalone IPO candidates. Um, so if you really do the math and, and you zoom out and, and you say, okay, great, everybody has this wild ambition to create this um, new category defining new technology and I'm all about it and you should think that way and run your startup that way. Um, but in reality, you are going to hit gale force winds uh, going against you in many different directions. And at every time, that you are in a position to raise money, that is the perfect inflection point to look around, listen to the market, listen to your investors, listen to your team, your co-founders, and say, the decision that we make now is going to potentially be an incredibly important decision because we're going to take more money that's going to lock us up to, to continue our journey. Is that the right decision to make? And you're going to get all kinds of different uh, opinions from whoever you ask that have different incentives, right? Um, most VCs will say, "Keep going, keep going. You're not, you're not CrowdStrike yet. Keep going." Uh, and it, for some founders, that is the right answer, and some founders, that that's the wrong answer. And um, you know, I've seen, I've seen it from both sides. Um, so I think the point is that ultimately, uh, my message to other founders is that to your company. Um, you know, take everyone's input, take it seriously, but ultimately, uh, you and your co-founders need to make that decision for yourselves. And, um, there, there is a lifetime you can start another company and, and, uh, continue the journey. I've proven that to be true. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've never want to take the easy road. I've just tried to make the right decisions for, um, the, the best of all the shareholders, including the, the common shareholders. Uh, but, but in addition to that, the investors, I want them to get a return on the investment. And if I think, you know, selling to Sumo logic is the, is the surest path to that than putting five years in and, and seeing kind of the uncertainty of the market, um, uh, you know, we, we made that gamble. I think at the end we, we paid off uh, pretty big. So tell me then how this relates to the story of ghost and, and kind of the, the founding moments there, which is what, 2022, maybe late 2021 that you are kind of getting going with Ghost and and making this transition. How did the whole category building versus following logic come into play? And and what did those kind of early days look like in terms of making the decision to go off and build company number three? That's a great question, Kyle. I think that, um, you know, looking back after doing a couple of like first mover category defining, I, I felt like maybe I don't necessarily want to uh, do that a third time. And uh, I, I think we're we're kind of ha- half foot in that, half foot out uh, in that, you know, we're, we're going into API security uh, market, which is well defined and, and you could argue very crowded and, and hot space. Um, but we're taking such a different kind of take at it the, at Ghost that um, <coughs> and you could argue we're blazing our own path and, and creating a category. So uh, I think we're kind of getting the best of both worlds there. 
Um, but I think that the thought process that my co-founders, Josh and Eric and I had when we started Ghost was let's let's spend enough time and talk to enough people to figure out what is a problem set that um, we can pick to work on um, that is not just a huge gap now, but will continue to be a big problem for the next decade or two. And um, the, the, the story I like to tell is that, um, you know, if we only cared about being the most relevant um, problem today, we would have just built a ransomware uh, protection company because that's what everybody cares about right now. Uh, but ultimately, we, we didn't want to do the, the hot current trend. Um, you could argue API is kind of uh, hot and current. But um, we, we picked apps running in the cloud. So our belief is that, um, you know, since the IT has, you know, moved to SaaS and, and cloud, the, the whole kind of security footprint um, and attack um, surface has shown to be comprised of three main things, right? The, the users, the identity that, uh, of the users and so on, the, the data itself, that's the data privacy, sovereignty, security, and, and the apps, um, it really kind of simplifies the, the problem because your cloud provider is taking care of running and protecting the infrastructure for you. Now, uh, there's some caveats there. You can screw yourself in, in the cloud too. Everybody knows that. And that's why Wiz is such a valuable company. Um, but, uh, if, if you focus on those three important things, the, the users, the data and the apps, we, we were looking for, where's the biggest gap, uh, in, in those, uh, three areas where people are not driving enough innovation. And, and we found app, uh, to be kind of the, I think the juiciest. And, um, I think app security in general has been a tough space, uh, for a lot of different reasons and a, a complex one from a cybersecurity product and business perspective, uh, a lot of legacy products out there uh, and technologies that are still in use, like uh, WAF technologies that are, you know, lifted and shifted in VMs and, and running in line in the cloud, a lot of crazy, stupid stuff like that, that we were seeing and we we're just like, okay, this is where we make our mark. This is where we come and um, bull in a china shop and start breaking things. And, and that's what we picked at Ghost. Like, let's go in and smash the status quo up. So a, a big part of the focus at Ghost, my understanding, is kind of breaking down these different integrations, understanding uh, and, and kind of contextualizing risk uh, with the knowledge of all these different connection points for an organization, right? So you mentioned the emphasis on all these different SaaS tools and thinking about like, SSPM, for example, which has emerged over the last couple of years as focused on all these cloud-based apps and, and risks that exist there. How has that changed your lens in terms of thinking about your focus with Ghost as just a, a kind of different angle of thinking about a similar problem in that growing SaaS risk? Yeah, that that's a good question. I think that um, you know our mission at Ghost is to protect every app running in the cloud. Um, so we're protecting customers, kind of homegrown apps that they're running in the cloud. And, um, you know, how do you do that? I think context and risk are the two words that I'll pull out of, of what you said that I think are, are kind of the, the most important because that's, that's what we're here for when, um, you know, you get very caught up and, you know, I'm going to use machine learning to detect the next, you know, command and control beacon. Um, you got to zoom out from the, the how, and you have to think, why am I here? I'm here to reduce the risk for the organizations that are, that are paying me. Um, so how do you do that? I think, you know, providing as much context as possible, um, on the, the, the risk to those apps running in the cloud. And, and that is so many different, uh, areas of information that can be pulled into it, whether it's third party sources like that, that, uh, look at SaaS risk, whether it's, um, you know, supply chain, uh, what's connecting to your apps and APIs, whether it's, um, you know, monitoring the, the data sources itself that's traversing is there, behavioral changes in the data streams is there sensitive data included uh, in that app traffic um, this is all context that that uh, we use to try to kind of elevate the art because if you if we're really honest like what was the art before what is a what is a WAP? what is a what is a vulnerability scanner it, it's like a regex pattern matching tool that literally just says is is this uh sql injection string you know available in this http request fire off an alert uh we 
everybody who's worked in the SOC knows how successful that is at reducing the risk for an organization. I think it just costs money in, in terms of people having to go through false positives in, in, in the best case, right? And, um, you know, there there's just so much, you know, elevation required to to the art of, of, of reducing risk when it comes to AppSec. We just saw so many opportunities. We can innovate and do things better. And um, the, the bar was was really low, Kyle, uh, not to throw uh, too many folks under the bus. But, you know, there, there was so many cool things that, that was uh, sky was the, the limit. Um, so we're in there creating our innovation. We're doing a lot of cool things, a lot of innovation. Here it goes. I'm super excited about it. And uh, we're definitely blazing our, our own trail here in terms of what we're doing. And that poses some of the same challenges I talked about before is that you have to educate people that, what is this thing? Is this a next gen WAF? Is this uh what, you know, is this like a whiz for apps in the cloud? Like, well, how do you describe what you're doing? What is the Gardner acronym? And, uh, you know, unfortunately when you blaze a new trail, you, you don't have those answers. You have to figure them out along the way. Um, that's the journey here. We're, we're focused on, you know, solving problems, reducing risks, innovating, building new technology. And now we have the back end of the market and figure out, okay, now how can people wrap their head around what we're doing? And uh, that poses a whole another set of challenges. It's, it's fun. And you mentioned the Reaper kind of community platform previously. How does that tie into your strategy in terms of kind of disrupting some of these other players, getting more awareness in the market and just the kind of overall ghost vision? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we built Reaper as a tool internally for testing and training. It's uh, it's kind of like a dynamic fuzzing tool similar to Burp Suite, but uh, we wanted to do one that was written in Golang, that had a very modern UI, that, that ran you know, multi-platform on, on our MacBooks, and uh, was just very simple to eat, uh, use, like a point-and-click, drag-and-drop, you know, no code. Uh, type of interface for doing these really complex, uh, you know, application security testing workflows. And so we built this tool and um, we were using it internally. We're like, and this is really cool. We should, we should, we should release this to the, to the public. And um, we, we did, you know, without a big uh, plan or strategy in place of how this ties to what we're doing overall from a product and company perspective but it's cool thought leadership to put out there. It's giving back to the community. If it's valuable to us, maybe it's valuable for someone else. And um, so we did put a little effort into to promoting it just just for fun to see what would happen. And uh, I think we've gotten a great response. Um, it hasn't. Uh, the community hasn't started submitting a bunch of code like you would hope with the, with an open source project. But you know, I think we just need to uh, continue to push it and update it, and, and the community will come. I think eventually, if you're doing cool things and people will find you and and uh, and also get a passion about those projects and uh, that that's our bet with reaper and maybe one day we'll figure out a way to tie it back to our hardcore product right sure now i have to ask because we talked about this way earlier in the episode which is the value of silicon valley over new york you decided to start Ghost in Austin. Yeah. You're not alone in that. I noticed that you're an investor in NetRise. I had Tom on okay. the podcast previously. There's some great companies out in Austin, no question. Uh, tell me a little bit more about just that decision, maybe a layer beyond uh, everyone kind of has this flexibility post COVID to work from wherever. Yeah, I think um, I will get right to the heart of it. Um, before I would say um, COVID, there was a shift happening before COVID even happened where uh, the, the Silicon Valley VCs that were the best you know, money to take if you were going to do a, a startup, um, they started to really kind of relax the requirements about you having to be in the Bay Area. Why is that? Because you know, rent costs, employment was getting so high. You were competing with fang companies like Google, Facebook, and so on to um, uh, recruit your top engineering talent that they were like, okay, we understand if you want to go somewhere else, Austin, Nashville, wherever, um, you know, they were starting to become more open to that. And then obviously COVID accelerated that trend. Uh, investors started leaving California themselves and, and you found VCs pop up in Austin, Miami, and, and other places. Um, so I think that um, the, the game has changed where those kind of unwritten requirements used to be there. They're no longer there anymore. 
And uh, most VCs have gotten adept at finding and, and uh, uh, investing in deals wherever they may be in, in different geos. And, and I think that uh, also some success stories like uh, Duo Security, um, you know, building and running their company out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, have proven that it's not a requirement to be in Menlo Park or Palo Alto. And uh, so I think there are still advantages to being there. If you are young and you're doing your first startup and you can move there, it's not going to be, um, you know, a, a complete detrimental uh, effect to your life, then I would say go try it out. I do think that you'll get some benefit. Uh, for me personally, um, you know, I, I found Austin to be uh, a more open, uh, exciting, fun place to live and, and uh, a lot of talent here that was easier to recruit and hire. I think even higher quality talent. Uh, for the same or, or, you know, I thought there'd be a big discount in, in what we pay engineers. That's not really the case. Um, maybe a small discount from the Bay Area. Um, but I do think that the, the the availability and quality of talent here is, is much higher in Austin was, was my experience. Okay. So ceremonial last question for you. Just for the listeners, are you currently looking for investment or hiring? Uh, not investment, uh, but we are uh, always hiring for the right people. Um, security researcher and product managers are very high uh, on our list right now. And uh, we have a high bar, but it's an incredible team to join. So if you feel like you check those boxes or you know somebody who does, please uh, send them my way and uh, we are uh, quick to, to reach out. So Awesome. Um, Kyle. This has been super fun. Thank you so much yeah, no, for having me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I feel like uh, there was a little bit of an injustice just having to skip over some of these sections, like the JASC story that we could have spent over an hour on just alone there. So really appreciate your willingness to, to jump around with me and wishing you all the best with Thanks, the next Kyle. steps for Ghost here. Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and you can write to me at kyle at secureventures.io. I'm Kyle McNulty, and you've been listening to Secure Ventures.